Praise the Lord, friends. I'm so glad that you tuned in today for the broadcast. I'm gonna be talking today about enemies of the word. And you know what? Satan wants to steal the word out of your heart because he knows the power that it has to produce a harvest in your life. So number one, we're talking about do not be distracted. There's all these distractions that the enemy tries to bring. And number two, we're gonna talk about do not be offended. Open your heart and receive the word today. Praise the Lord, friends, and welcome to the broadcast. I'm so glad that you tuned in today. I'm gonna to be sharing today from Mark chapter four. We're talking about the parable of the sower. Actually, Jesus talks about the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter four, and Luke chapter eight. And he says, if you can understand this principle, if you can understand the principles that are laid out in the parable of the sower, that you can understand basically all the parables or you can understand the things of the kingdom because everything in the kingdom works like the parable of the sower. Now there's a lot in it and there's some very basic principles that we see. And today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about the condition of the soil or the condition of your heart. And you've gotta guard the condition of your heart. Your heart is bringing forth a harvest. And the fact is if you don't like the harvest that you're receiving, you can change it. And you can change the harvest that you're receiving by changing the condition of your heart. It's just like if you're growing a garden. If you don't like what's out there growing, you can change it. And you can change it by changing the seeds that are sown. And if you see weeds coming up, what do you do? You go pull them, you go chop them down. You know, different things that you do to deal with those certain aspects. So you are the one who is in charge of your heart. God is not gonna make you bring forth a good harvest. You know what, your heart is designed to bring forth a harvest and it is bringing forth a harvest. But you are the one that determines whether your heart is bringing forth a harvest of good or a harvest of evil. So let's open our heart and get into the word of God. We're in Mark chapter four, verse 13. Jesus says this, don't you know this parable? And how will you know all parables? In other words, if you can understand the very simple, basic elements of this parable, the parable of the sower, you can understand all parables. Then he says, the sower sows the word. Now, when we talked in our broadcast yesterday, we talked a little bit about the nature of the word and how the word releases the nature of God. The, the word releases a harvest of good things, of salvation, sanctification, life, health, peace, righteousness, healing, you know, provision. All these things come from the word of God. And I can show you promises throughout the scripture. You know, we, we talked about how the wisdom that's from above in James chapter three, verse 16 and verse 17 is first of all, pure then peaceable, uh, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. Praise God. It, the, the nature of God is a good nature and the word of God, the sower, Praise God, Jesus is sowing the word and different people are sharing the word, sowing the word, but the, the word is consistent. But we are the ones who determines what that word ultimately brings forth. Now, as we begin to look at this, we talked about the nature of the harvest. We said the nature of the harvest, again, salvation, sanctification, truth, freedom, life, health, provision, peace, righteousness, all of these things the word produces. Now, when Jesus begins to explain the parable of the sower, in Mark chapter 4, verse 15 to verse 19, Jesus explains how this seed brought forth different harvests in different places. And, and as he talked about the sower, he said the sower, first of all, sowed by the wayside. So this is like the farmers on the way to the field and some of the grain fell out on the road, right? Fell out and, and before it could even get in the ground, the birds came and ate it. And he said, these are they, in verse 15, that are sown by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that is sown in your heart. Do you know what? Satan wants to come immediately and steal the word that's been sown in your heart. 
because the word has the power to change your life. The word has the power to produce a harvest of salvation, sanctification, truth, life, peace, provision, health, blessing, good things come from the word, right? And, and so Satan wants to steal that word before it ever brings forth the harvest because he knows the power of that word in your life. Then he says, these likewise are they who sown on stony ground. Now, the farmer then went into the field and he sowed some seed in rocky soil. And, and it grew up really quickly, but then it, because it had no root in itself, when afflictions and persecutions came for the word's sake, right? Th then immediately they, were, they are offended. That's what this talks about. You know, there, if you ever sowed seed, I remember when we first moved to Colorado Springs, I grew up in southeastern Colorado in the valley. And you know what? We had good, thick soil down there. We could plow water. We could grow almost anything that would grow in this climate. And, and you know, um, you know, we would plant these summer squash. We had a garden plot that we planted. And you know those summer squash, you didn't have to plant them. They'd come up year after year. They'd just grow. And I love these yellow crook. Now I, I call them summer squash, yellow crook mix squash. You know, if you, if you want to know how to cook them, slice them thin, you know, crossways, boil them for about nine minutes in, and then pour the water off and put a lot of butter, the secret of French cooking is butter, and then, you know, salt and pepper them to your taste. Ah, oh, they're delicious, praise God. So I love those summer squash. So when we moved to Colorado Springs 20, over 20 years ago, I thought I'm gonna grow some of those. I was living in the southwest side of the city. And so it's really on the side of Cheyenne Mountain. And so I, I went out in my front yard where there was a parking space between the oak trees and thought, well, the sun shines in here good from the south and from the west, it'll grow good. And I dug a little ditch on the side of that where, the, where it was right in the sun. And, and I planted some of those summer squash seed and I watered it real good. And it grew up and it grew these great, big, beautiful vines. And then they had great big flowers like this big round. I mean, there were giant flowers. I could just, I could smell those squash cooking in the pot. I could taste eating them as they cooked. And then it grew squash. They were about this long and about a quarter inch, not even a quarter inch in diameter. And, and they, they died on the vine. Why? Because there was no earth there. That was basically, the earth there was basically ground up granite. And so that's what Jesus is saying. This seed that's sown in the stony soil is like that. It might look pretty. It might bring forth big flowers, but it doesn't have anything that's lasting. It doesn't have anything with sustenance or substance to it. Why? Because it has no root. And it says, these are they that are sown in the stony soil. When they heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. But verse 17 says, they have no root in themselves. And so after they endure for a time and then affliction and persecution, persecution arises for the word's sake and immediately they are offended. I've seen believers like this. I've seen people that come from traditional churches and I came from a traditional church. I'm not against a traditional church. I got saved in a traditional church, but they come over into our kind of side of the gospel for a while and then people begin to question them. What do you think about that healing stuff? What do you think about that message on prosperity? And, and they begin to, you know, come to me and say, pastor, you know, what about healing? So I ask them, what do you believe? Now, if, if, about healing, for instance, and, and I asked this question to one of these people who was being persecuted because he'd come to our church from a traditional church. And I said, well, what do you believe about a healing? Do you believe, A, that divine healing is provided in the atonement, that Jesus provided divine healing when he died and rose again by the stripes on his back, and sometimes people receive it and sometimes they don't? Do you believe, B, that sometimes God heals and sometimes God doesn't heal? It's all up to God. Or do you believe, C, that God doesn't heal anymore? And, and now I said, whatever answer that you give me, you have to answer that with the word. And there's only one of those that you can prove with the word. You see, because it's really not up to God, it's up to us. When you study the, 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 the healings in the life of Jesus, many times Jesus said to them when they were healed, according to your faith, be it unto you. You see, Jesus was the healer. He was the grace of God. He provided healing for everyone. There's 14 times that it's written in the New Testament that Jesus healed them, everyone. They brought unto him all who were sick of every kind of diseases, and he healed them, everyone. One. 
Jesus healed them, everyone, every person and every kind of sickness and disease among the people. Now, I realize that we're not Jesus, but you know what? The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But they had to come. They had to reach out to him. They had to believe so that they could receive from Jesus. And at least 98% of those individual accounts where Jesus healed people, I can see as I see in the word of God that it was their personal faith that, that, that caused them to receive from Jesus. They came, Jesus said, according to your faith be it unto you. And so there were these different things. So if you want to receive these things from God, it's important for you to believe them. And if you don't believe them, you're not going to receive them. Or, you know, so is it A, that divine healings provided for in the atonement that, you know, he was wounded for our transgressions and by his stripes we were healed. And, and sometimes people receive it or sometimes they don't. Is it B, sometimes God heals, sometimes God doesn't. It's all up to God. You never know, right? Or is it C, God doesn't heal anymore? Now, most of you are smart enough to know that God still heals people today. You know, there's a few churches that still believe that God doesn't heal anymore, but they're kind of out there. And you know what? I just bring some of those people to my church and I could give them all kinds of testimonies. People that were healed, given less than six months to live at Mayo Clinic and healed. We have a young man that was healed last year. He was on 11 different medications today, a day when he had a good day. He had a very bad digestive, you know, uh, disorder. The, the doctor said that he'll die young, that he won't live a long, healthy life. But one day he got up. He had been in our church about four years. And he said, you know what? God healed Pastor Lawson when he was a little boy. And I believe that God will heal me. I'm done with this sickness. I'm done with this disease. And I'm done with the devil. Praise God. And that day God healed him. Praise God. And he's been back to the doctors. They, they say that he's normal. That's a wonderful testimony. Praise God. He's going to live a good, long, healthy life. I believe he's going to preach the the gospel. I believe he's going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. I believe he's going to see people healed and set free by the power of God. His mama asked him when he's just 10 years old, he, she said, Jackson, what would you do if, if you got, you know, if you had a million dollars? He said, well, I would build a church and I would support missionaries. Praise God. And so I believe Jackson is going in the right direction. Praise God. And Jesus is taking his life in a good direction. But you know what? Jackson let the word of God go down in his heart and he believed that word for himself and that word of God produced a harvest and you know what nobody can argue Jackson out of it praise God because that word is working in his life friends I want to take just a moment to share with you something that I believe has the power to change your life I'm talking about the Word of God. And I've got a special package that I'm making available. I'm calling it the Word Package. And the first teaching that I have is a three CD teaching on the parable of the sower. The other one that I have is a multiple CD teaching on the power and life of the Word. And then I have the book, The Power and Life of the Word. And you know what? These are principles that I have found in my life that work. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and verse 11, that the word of God that comes from heaven produces a harvest. It does not return void. It accomplishes what God pleases and it prospers the thing he sends it to. And we have a special offer. You can get either one of the CD teachings or the book itself, or you can get all three. And you know what? The best deal is to get them all three. We know if you get this, that it will bless you and help you. Thanks so much. Praise the Lord. We're right here in Mark chapter 4, and we're talking about the parable of the sower and Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower. We, we studied in verse 15 where he said that, that the seed that is sown on the wayside that falls out of the plant or on the way to the field and, and the birds come and eat it, that's like when Satan comes immediately to take the word because he knows the power of the word to produce a harvest. We talk secondly about the word that's sown on stony ground and it comes up and it looks pretty, but it, it has no root. It can't produce fruit in the long term because it has no root in itself. And it said, Jesus said, these are those who, you know what? Uh, they, they receive the word joyfully, but afterward, when persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Then he said the third type of soil, he says, these are they who are sown among the weeds, 
among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, this is in verse 19, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You know where I grew up in southeastern Colorado, it's a very dry climate. In good years, they receive about 17 inches of annual moisture per year. But it's a good climate to grow winter wheat. But we can on, they only grow a crop generally every other year in southeastern Colorado. So they rotate the crops. And so what they do is they, they farm, you know, on a year that we're going to sow a, a field, we start farming early in the spring as soon as the weeds come up, about the end of May. And, and we'll, we'll farm that, you know, three or four times during the summer. And the whole reason for us to farm that is to keep the weeds down so that they don't compete for the moisture that's there. And then about the 1st of September, we sow that winter wheat. We plant that winter wheat. And it comes up and it looks like grass and it just covers the ground. And then the next spring when the rains come, different things that begin to shoot up and it'll, it'll grow about two feet tall. And after it grows about two feet tall in, in about the first of July, we send the combines in to get the harvest. Praise God. But then, then we let it lay fallow for a year and then we begin to farm again. So, so we, it takes two years to grow one crop. But what we have to do is we have to, the whole reason that we're out there plowing that and, and working that soil, you know, three or four, even some people work f five times, you know, before they plant, that is to keep the weeds down so they're not competing for the moisture so that seed, right, that wheat seed can get the harvest. Now, Jesus said, there are those that are so sown among thorns. If we didn't do that and we just went out there and and we planted that field, right? And we never worked the soil, the weeds would come up and, and, it, and, and they would choke the seed and we, would have, we wouldn't even have enough harvest to run the combines through the field. But he, he says this, he said, these are like in the Christian life when the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. You know, there are things that the enemy wants to bring in your life, just different cares. Just you get so weighted down with just taking care of life and the deceitfulness of riches. You're, you're trying to make money so bad that you know what? You don't even have time to really think sometimes and the lust of other things, other things come in and they choke choke that word and it becomes unfruitful. You see, but then he says in verse 20, these are they which are sown on the good ground. Say, I am good ground. And what is good ground? Such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some 30 fold, some 60 fold, and some 100. You know what, when we would grow uh, our fields in southeastern Colorado on the irrigated ground, we would sow that field, you know, about the same time, about the first of September, and then if everything was right, we would irrigate that seed, and that seed would come up. Again, it looks like little grass just covering the ground. And then in about April, we call it being in the boot, it would grow up about this high, and if you split that, uh, that apart, you can see down in there a little stock and at the at top of it, it's a little head and, and you know what but we would pour the water on it which, when it's in the boot we call it and then it would bring forth a hundred bushel wheat that's a hundred fold because we'd sow one bushel per acre and we'd receive back a hundred bushels per acre. We did this numbers of times because we could control the moisture on it. Praise God, we could control the irrigated ground much better than the, the non-irrigated ground. So it was different. And we planted that year after year after year after year and received harvest year after year after year. Now there were different things. There were still weeds. Sometimes we would spray those weeds. You know, different things would try to come. There's still storms that would come, but we would, we would do our best to get in the harvest every year. And you know what? Your heart is designed to produce a harvest. In fact, your heart is producing a harvest. But if you don't like the harvest that your heart's producing, you, have, you, can, you can change it. And here's how you change it. Do you know? The first thing, you know, you, you have to recognize the enemy. Satan is the enemy of the word. And he's the enemy of the word because he knows the power of the word to produce a harvest in your life. So the first back aspect is you don't want to be deceived. You see, the enemy knows that the word will produce a harvest. And some people are not doing much with the word and they don't have a problem with the devil, but the devil is coming to steal the word out of their life. 
You see, uh, so, so as soon as you begin to sow the word, you, you should expect challenges, difficulties, and problems, but you can overcome by the word of God in you. Now, I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 5 because he talks about how the enemy comes to steal. And the enemy wants to sow, steal that seed. What? Before it ever grows, before it ever really has a chance to grow because he knows that that word will produce a powerful harvest in God's kingdom. He says this in I'm going to actually start in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. All of you be subject to one another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. Did you know for a harvest to come forth, it takes time. It takes seed, time. Amen. There's seed, time, and harvest, right? So he says, you know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that God may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. Don't worry, for he cares for you. He says, be sober, be watchful, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, Satan is your adversary. And he comes as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion, but he comes like a roaring lion. And he walks about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. He says, whom resist? Resist the devil steadfast in the faith. Stay steadfast in the faith. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we need to resist the devil. We need to be watchful, right? We need to be sober, know what, where we're going, what we're doing, and we need to resist the devil steadfast in the faith. Why? So the word of God can bring forth a harvest. Now, just before this, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to verse 14, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is a trial you, as so, though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. You see, everybody in the world, sometimes people in the world don't celebrate you. But you don't have to wor worry if the world doesn't celebrate you. What you really need to know is that God is celebrating you. Praise God. And so he says, he says, rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory re be revealed, you may rejoice, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So God will be glorified. We need to let God be glorified in our life. So he's writing about this, be watchful, right? Be sober because your adversary of the devil, he's talking about there's gonna be persecution, right? And when people come against you, a lot of times what the enemy is really after is he is after the word that is in your heart because he knows that word, if it's left in your heart and if, if it's undisturbed, that word is gonna produce a harvest. So do not be deceived. Satan is the enemy of the word. The second thing is you don't want to be offended. You see, because the second type of ground we talked about was the stony soil. And you know what? When, when Jesus explained that parable in Mark chapter 4, verse 15 to verse 19, he said those that are sown on stony ground are those and immediately they receive the word with gladness. They're really happy. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. This word's good. It's so good to hear this good news that he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their affliction that by Jesus stripes that we're healed that beloved I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in good health it's so good to hear these good promises that my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 it's so good to hear these promises like thir Psalm 35 and verse 27 that says let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause yea let them say continually let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in in the prosperity of his servant. Amen. It's so good to hear the promises of God. But when somebody
somebody comes and said, what do you think about that healing stuff? What about that prosperity stuff? I really don't believe that's for everybody. What do you think? You see, that's, that's really the enemy because what's he trying to do? He's trying to sow seeds of doubt. He's trying to sow seeds that will cause you to question that word of God. So that word doesn't have the power then to produce a harvest in your life. Jesus said these are they, immediately they receive the word with gladness, but persecution and affliction comes for the word's sake and immediately they are offended. So number one, you don't want to be deceived, but number two, you don't want to be offended. Because what is this? This is really religion and tradition that's coming to fight the Word of God. Jesus talked about this in Mark chapter 7. And I want to go over there. And he said in Mark chapter 7, by your traditions, you make the Word of God of no effect. Do you want the Word of God to be effective in your life? Then you have to guard against traditions of men that come against the Word. Now, he talks about this in Mark chapter uh, uh, 7. He says this, this people honors me in verse six with their lips, their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. Are we teaching what the Bible says? Because a lot of times people persecute you because of religion and tradition, but they don't even know what the word says. And he goes on and says in verse eight, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, such as the washing of pots and cups and many other things that you do. And he said unto them, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. So many times people come fight you for the word's sake and they're rejecting the word of God to keep their tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, whosoever curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is the gift by whatever you might be profited by me, he will be free. And if you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you delivered and many such things like this you do. So do you know what? You have to beware that you don't make the word of God ineffective by your traditions. So if we want the word of God to bring forth a harvest in our life, number one, we can't let the enemy steal the word because the enemy wants to come and steal the word because he knows the power of that word and that word's gonna produce an awesome harvest in our life. And number two, we have to, we have to hold on to that word and not let people, well-meaning people sometimes come and steal that word by persecuting us and coming in against us for the word of God. So if you'll hold on to the word of God, amen, the word of God will hold on to you and it will produce a harvest of life in your life. Blessings. God wants the seed of his word to produce a harvest in your life. In this package, containing the parable of the sower and the power and life of the word, you'll learn the importance of planting God's word in your heart so that you can receive all God has promised you. Sow the word in your heart and watch it bring forth fruit. You can get this special package for $39. Call 719-418-4000 or visit karischristiancenter.com. Do you like to shop? But we have some real helpful information for you. You can go to karischristiancenter.com, go to our store. We have many different teaching CDs. We have lots of books and good information. You can get it, you can give it as gifts. It will help people be built up in the faith. So check it out, karischristiancenter.com. Thanks so much, blessings. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast has been made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719-418-4000. Or to partner online, go to karischristiancenter.com slash give. You can write us at P.O. Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today.